God praise this morning.
stand. You can be seated. Good morning. My name is Kendall Kramer, and my husband Mark and I have been attending 121 since 2015. I help out with our Lionheart Scholarship Program, which is part of our Vision 2025, and I also serve on a few of our A-teams for our global workers. If you don't know what an A-team is, um, it's just a group of us here at 121 that support a global worker. That can be texting, praying, um, having Zoom calls with them, if they're having um, struggles or frustrations, we're a safe spot for them to be able to share that with and lift them up in prayer. So if anybody has any interest in joining an A-team or learning more about that, you can contact Elvis Gallegos or Arnaldo Soto, and we'd be happy to talk to you about that. Okay. Our scripture today is Genesis 1-1, 1, 1, 1, 26 through 28 and 2, 23 through 25. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. God created man in his own image, and the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. For this reason a man shall leave his father and his mother, and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed." Let's pray. God, thank you so much just for bringing us here together today, for giving us the freedom to worship um, in this space with each other and have community, God. I pray for our global workers as they are um, worshiping you sometimes alone, Lord. I pray that they would not feel alone, but feel connected to the body, God. Um, I pray that as your words are spoken today, that our hearts and our ears would just hear them internalize them, and go out into the world and reflect you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for that, Kendall. I just met Kendall in the green room. We have a green room at 121. You should know that. I didn't know. My name is Doug Sanders. Um, this is the part where I'm supposed to talk about our life group. I'm going to do that in the next service. I'm going to clarify one thing, and I just went to the dark. <laughs> there we are. It's probably a bad sign. Uh, so about a month ago, my daughter Audrey was baptized. You might remember it. I was the guy crying in the tank right out for Thank you for that. Um, if I have to clarify one thing, I messed up in one part. Uh, we talked about a conversation between Jesus and God two times in the Bible. Uh, once it is baptism, I got that part right. The second, I said the tribulation. It's incorrect. I meant the transfiguration. I had to clarify that. I was praying on this yesterday. I'm going to use this opportunity. You have to, in my defense, I went to Texas Tech and them some big words. Transfiguration, not tribulation. So obviously the church trusts me enough to do baptism today. So you got B team up here. We're going to talk about baptism. I'm going to kick it up, to, kick it out to them. What is baptism? So what we believe here is baptism is a symbolic act. Um, it's something of a heart change, right? It's something where we're giving up or we're dying to our own sins and we're giving that to Jesus. Um, it's important to note anyone that's thinking about baptism, it's not salvation. You're not saved through it. Um, but it's something that we give as, a, as an act of obedience. So what we're going to see today is exciting. We always get really excited because we're going fully immersed underwater. We're coming up that's dying to our own sins. We're excited because we're coming up covered in Jesus. So we're really excited about that. We're pumped. We're going to kick it out to them and watch some awesome baptisms. Thank you. of something that could be a foundation for our family, but we did not know what that was. 
I remember walking by Creation Land and knowing I wanted to raise our future children in a place that exuded that kind of love. When we got pregnant with Raylan, I just hoped and prayed that one day she would come to know Jesus the way that we were learning to, and that she would have Jesus as a firm foundation throughout her life. From birth, she has been poured into from all the amazing women in Creation Land, um, Pam, Buffy, Rose, Kathy, Pat, and Vicki, just to name a few, and they have loved her so much and so well. I want to share how we described our daughter for her dedication that was right before her second birthday with her brother. She has absolutely remained true to herself, and here is what we wrote for Miss Pam. Can you go ahead and read that. Raylan is an independent, funny, and adventurous, and caring free spirit. She loves to dance and sing, run wild, swim, climb, and play with her friends. She loves her baby brother and is good at helping and is a good helping hand of mom whenever she wants to be. Ray definitely knows how to bring a smile to everyone's face with her silly performing side. She loves to pray and make sure that family prays several times during each one of our meals. Raylan has continued to grow in each wonderful gift that the Lord has given her. She especially loves to worship and serve in kids and invite friends to church. One night last September, as we sat at the dinner table, Raylan started discussing Jesus with us, as she typically would, but this time there was a true understanding that came with the conversation. <laughs> she shared the gospel with us, and she expressed... I can do it. <laughs> you good? Um, she expressed how she knew she needed a savior. In that moment, I asked her if she was ready to have a conversation with Miss Diana, and she said yes without hesitation. She was absolutely ready to accept Jesus. When we got to the church, she went in with Miss Diana alone, as I knew that she would. Raylan loves to do things on her own terms. Uh, when they came out of the room, Miss Diana shared that she prayed that prayer with confidence and accepted Jesus into her heart. As we battle through big feelings and emotions, she knows that she needs Jesus and can do absolutely anything with God. She loves to share her love of Jesus with her friends, a lot of whom are here today, and is excited to be baptized and show her faith in Christ. Well, we love you. Um, our prayer for you is that as you continue to grow in all aspects of life, um, as our daughter, as a sister, as a friend, as a teammate, as a classmate, um, that you do all these things for the glory of God and his kingdom and hold on to the truth that your identity is found in Christ and Christ alone. And since you profess your faith in Jesus, we baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. <laughs> if we can go back out, I think we've got one more. Here we go. Yeah, there we go. All right, this is uh, this is my friend Joe Howell, and uh, I've had the privilege of being able to walk with, with Joe over the last year or so, uh, as he's just really grown in his faith. And what Joe says is, is that he could you could describe his life before he knew Jesus as discontent. Um, and, and if you looked, you kind of ask, okay, why? Uh, on the surface, everything looked great. Uh, it was he had the he had a great job, he had a great wife, uh, uh, two boys, uh, just loving family. Everything was 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 great on the surface, uh, but just underneath there was just this uh, overall lack of contentment in his life. And then uh, what that resulted in was this bitterness and kind of this 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 anger. Um, and he says that he was he grew up in church. He grew up uh, in a loving home with loving parents who taught him how to read scripture, taught him how to pray, um, how, how to, what a loving marriage looks like. Um, but he he says if you know anybody uh, if anybody you know that he knows, um, they would say he's 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 pretty headstrong. Uh, and, and so because of that kind of stubborn, um, he lived life for himself. And so he kind of went his, his own way, um, apart from the church and apart from Christ. And, and then uh, what happened, though, is even in the midst of that, in the midst of the messiness, uh, God brought his wife, Jana, into his life. And just uh, he, he says that her love and patience for me and her prayers have been a true blessing in my life. Through her, God has brought other people into my life that helped me to see what I was missing. And over the past year, he realized that no matter what he does, if, I, if he doesn't have a relationship with Jesus, something will always be missing. Uh, and so Joe uh, is, is, is a follower of Christ now. He's the first to say that he's a work in progress, uh, but there's just a freeing feeling that, that he has now. Um, and, and he says this, he says, I, I know I'm broken and far from perfect, but it's not about me. Jesus died for me to save me. 
Uh, and there's a peace and joy in that. And I, I, it's been so cool to watch him grow uh, over this last year as, as he's uh, gotten to know Christ. We've walked through the eight ways together. Uh, and, and in there to watch him grow in his, his reading of scripture and his prayer life and everything else. Um, and, and then part of that was also talking about baptism, what that looks like to step forward in obedience. And I've loved some of those conversations because uh, he wants to lead his family well. And so he wants to do what Christ called him to do so that he could lead his family well. So it, it's been so cool to watch. And he says uh, now he's accepted Christ. He's ready to share that openly and share that new life in Christ by being baptized. So, so Joe, it is uh, my pleasure uh, but, uh, to, uh, to baptize you. In the, because you're a follower of Jesus, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Gracefully, 
I'm strong when I am weak. I will be free. Yeah. Your power will work in me. I'm broken gracefully. I'm strong when I am weak. I will be free. Yeah. Your power will work in me. I'm broken gracefully. I'm strong when I am You know, when people raise their hands to worship, that's essentially what they're saying. Is God, I let go of everything because I know you can provide me for me better than I could ever provide for myself. There are a lot of us in this room, just like we heard in one of the baptism stories, that we're all broken. And the quicker we recognize that and put our trust and our dependency and lean into who God is, the better we're going to be. Because what he provides for us will bring joy that we'll never understand. But we welcome it. And I want you to know there's no place you can go that's too far that you can't run back. We need to know that today. God will meet us right where we are. So whatever you're going through this morning, whatever it is, just know that you can run to him. And he'll greet you with open arms. Running from life, from death, I feel. 
For a while now, I've been uh, praying about uh, an opportunity to be able to uh, just bring a message on uh, God's design uh, for, for life, and, and to do it in a way that uh, is not uh, immediately uh, contrasting with all the broken designs that, that people uh, bring to bear, to not talk about faulty ways or sinful ways or uh, to not, not lean on that part, but to just simply lay out uh, the beauty uh, of God's design. Uh, and then to just let that rest uh, on us. Uh, and, and my hope in this today would be uh, that for several, uh, that it would be refreshing for you. Uh, just to hear uh, and be reminded uh, of God's design, His layout. Uh, and then... Uh, my hope would be that for those who have maybe drifted a bit, it's easy to drift in our culture, uh, that if we've drifted a bit, that this might be a re-anchoring uh, inside of what God's design is. Um, and then I expect today that there will be several people disturbed by what I say. Um, and my hope would be that if it's disturbing to you, uh, that there could be conversation around it. That, that's one of my hopes today, that, that in thinking about this, the way that God has designed things, uh, that it would create more conversation this week, uh, and that we could continue to learn as a church body uh, to be the safest place to have the hardest dialogues, and that we could actually have real conversations where we disagree about things and, and we could each talk about the way we view it and why we come to that view. And my hope as a church that what we would do is we would come from Scripture as to why we land on a view. Amen. And just to have real conversations, that, that would be my hope. Now, there are things that I'll say today, just the very mention of it from Scripture and in the past, when I say things like this, I watch people physically get up and leave and not return. And I don't think you're going to the bathroom or going to get coffee. So if you need to get coffee or go to the bathroom, go real quick because I'm... <laughs> but but my, what I would ask today is that you listen to the whole message from beginning to end and then be willing to wrestle through the things that you might find yourself disagreeing with or be disturbed by. I also understand that we all bring our life experience to bear on what we hear from Scripture. And there are so many wounds and hurts and pains from the brokenness in our world that sometimes it's difficult to absorb and listen to what God's design is. So I just want you to know I know that today. And yet, 
this is still God's design. And this is not my idea. I'm passing on to you God's intent and God's design. And I think it's beautiful. I I hope today that what it does in our hearts as we listen, that it stirs afresh in us uh, just a love for God, that it would stir a gratitude for God, that, that it would cause us to be all the more in awe of Him, more than when we walked in these doors today. I was listening to Jen Wilkin the other night in a... Uh, YouTube talk she was doing a few years ago, and, and she began, and as I listened, I thought, man, she is so spot on with how she just began this talk. And she said, the reality is you're probably not going to be interested in what I have to say from God's Word unless Psalm 111.10, which interesting, the next day when I was spending time with the Lord, that's the psalm I was in, and it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And what Jen Wilkins said is, if, if there's not a respect for God, there won't be a respect for God's Word. And so what, part of what this reveals about our own hearts today is, do we have a, a reverence, an awe, a respect, a fear of God? Because a fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So it actually begins with a a respect for God. And that would be my prayer today too, that if there's not a respect for God, that He might turn your heart to have a respect for Him. And once we respect Him, then we'll respect His design. And we'll actually love His design because His design is life-giving. I want to wrap this around one idea that I I was reading this book, Sex, Romance, and the Glory of God by C.J. Mahaney, uh, and its subtitle is What Every Christian Husband Needs to Know. But there's one chapter in the back, the last chapter, that his wife writes, Carolyn, and, and she titled the chapter, The Pleasure of Purity. And when I read that, I just, that, <clears throat> that phrase just struck me, not just in a marriage relationship, not just in the sexual aspect of our marriage relationships, but just in God's design as a whole, the, the pleasure of purity. And that's how I want us to think as we think about God's design in Genesis 1 and 2, is the pleasure of purity. See, in Psalm 16, 11, The psalmist writes and says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forever. See, God is a God of pleasure. And every one of us are pleasure seekers. There's a reason that we seek pleasure. It's because God is a God of pleasure. And God is a God of purity. There's a place to find the pleasure, and it's inside of his design. So let's take a look at a a few major things that God unfolds in Genesis 1 and 2 that are actually the building blocks of all of life that are established in these two chapters. First thing I want us to think about is creation. And in in Genesis 1, we see who the Creator is, and from the outset, we see why the creation, and then all through the pages of Scripture, we see why. And what I love that God does here is He answers the who and the why, and that's not the kinds of questions that science is designed to answer. Science helps us with how and when and what and those kinds of questions. So it's actually a really beautiful compliment the way God designed things. And what we see is the who and the why in his creation. Let's begin in chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, in the very beginning, God. 
From the outset, as the pages of Scripture start to unfold, God is the subject of everything. He will continue to be the subject of the story. It is about God, and God uh, is the one to be glorified. It is all about God. Now, the word for God here is the Hebrew word Elohim. And Elohim is a Hebrew word that is plural. It expresses the majesty and the omnipotence and the power of God from the very outset. In the beginning, God, this majestic, powerful God. And it already expresses from the outset the triune nature of God. See, we learn later in Colossians chapter 1 that, uh, that Jesus is the one uh, that is the agent of creation. Jesus was involved in creation. In chapter uh, 1, verse 2, we see that the Holy Spirit of God is hovering about. So at the very outset of the pages of Scripture, it is the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit that is involved in all of creation. There's not an attempt to explain who God is. or uh, It's just simply, this is God. In the beginning, God. And what did God do? He created. The Hebrew word for created here is bara. And it carries with the idea uh, of the freedom and power of an artist to call into existence that which has not been in existence. So in the beginning, God created. Elohim bara. He's the artist with the power and the freedom to bring that which is not in existence, into existence. This is how God began. And what we see then is what he creates. And what we see initially is that everything is formless and empty. It lacks order and content. In the first three days, as it's laid out for us in Genesis 1, we see God lay out the form of his creation. In the first part, in verses 3 through 5, we see light and dark, day and night established. In day 2 of his creation, we see the expanse created. In other words, the waters are separated from each other so that now there's, there's a gap between the waters, the heavens, and the waters on earth. On day 3, earth and the vegetation on the earth are put in play. The plants and the trees. And they bear fruit after their own kind. See, God sets the form in place. Because God is a God of order. He's a God of beauty. A God of power. And now that the form is in place, then he brings life into those forms. On day four, we find in verses 14 through 19, and and if I could choose any uh, day that God created, if I could just be there, day four, I believe, is the day I would want to be there. The end of last week, we were with a group from Lionheart Children's Academy, and we were down in South Texas, and and when we were outside at nighttime, uh, there's not a lot in South Texas, and that's a beautiful place to be able to see against a black canopy, uh, just a population of stars like no other, uh, and to know that God has named every one of those stars, I just find that one of the most beautiful things to experience in God's creation. Day four is where I would want to be. And on day four, he created the two lights, the sun and the moon, one to govern the day, one to govern the night. And then he populated the the heavens with the stars. See, day one and day four correspond. Day one is the form. Day and night. On day four, he puts the lights in place to govern day and night. On day five, we see the fish and the birds. The fish come into the skies. He places them there, and the, uh, the, the birds in the sky, and the fish in the waters, and all the swarming creatures in the waters. See, on day two, he put the expanse. He separated the waters so that there would be a sky. And then on day five, the fish and the birds. Orderly, rational, form, then function. 
on day six, the land animals, and then human beings on day six. On the earth and the vegetation so they could survive, form, and then function. God is the creator out of nothing. He brought into that which exists. What he brought into existence, absolutely beautiful. It was his pleasure. He looked at it and said it was good. It was pure and it was perfect. Lisa and I went to the Dallas Aquarium the other day, and uh, we're like a couple of kids. We need to have grandkids, so we take people with us. Do do we have those pictures by any chance? Yeah. So that's an anteater. Uh, It's not the best shot. I mean, you see his nose kind of protruding out of the bottom there. But Lisa, it looks like a walking carpet. I mean, how how do you even think in your mind to, to create something like that? And yet, the anteater is one thing that God created, and then... uh, the toucan, I just think those are the coolest birds. Uh, and just, just think of God just with his brush and spurt stroke, just thinking about, okay, I want to make this bird. And he made this one. And then uh, – no, 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 you can go back. I just blanked on the name of it. What's the big fat seal? What is it? Manatee. His head's at the bottom. Can't you just see the delight in God as he created the manatee? I'm just going to make this big something that you think, I guess, is a rock. and not blew that thing up. This is standing in one of those arch, you know, glass areas. Like, we first thought it was a sticker. I mean, it's just, but, but that is a shark. You know, that's what he looks like on the bottom uh, of it. But just, there's just sheer delight what God's created, and the life that he brings. There's an order of beauty and a purity to it. Psalm 33, 6 says, By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. In Psalm 33, 9, he spoke, and it was done. He just spoke, and this is what happened. God created, he spoke, and it was done. And that which he spoke and was done, in Psalm 111, 2, greater the works of the Lord, they're studied by all who delight in them. Oh, that we find delight in his words and study. There's purity in that. It's God's design. God is separate from his creation. He's the creator. He's designed it. There's a second thing that we find when we look at the pleasure, the purity of God's design And he found pleasure in the purity of making male and female in the image of God. In verses 26 through 28, we see the uniqueness of our humanity. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. In verse 27, God created man, Barak. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. On the pleasure of God's purity, he made the uniqueness of humanity and he made them male and female. Now, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? Several people have wrestled, scholars have wrestled with this over the years of what does that mean and what does that look like? One way to say it is that in the image of God means that we are representatives of God and we are like God in many respects, but not in all respects. We're not like God in that we have all the wisdom, all the knowledge, all the power in the world. I think Wayne Grudem does a good job in helping us think about the image of God. That we are moral creatures. There is a sense of right and wrong within us, and in that sense, we're made in the image of God. We are aesthetic people, meaning, not me, but many of you can create, but all of us appreciate beauty. God creates beauty, and in the image of God, we appreciate that same kind of beauty. We're 
in the image of God in our mental capacities, the ability to reason and logic, the reason that there are disciplines like philosophy and logic and science is because of the reason and the logic that God has given us in His image. We're relational like God. We can have relationship with God and with each other. Being made in the image of God is why we value and give dignity to every person, regardless of who they are. This is the why. Made in the image of God. It's why someone's of value. It's why we dignify a person and respect a person. This dignity and respect, the psalmist writes in Psalm 139, begins in the womb. In God's design, verse 13 of 139, for you formed my inward parts, you wove me in my mother's womb. My niece is pregnant, and at five and a half weeks, they told her the gender of her baby. In the image of God, male and female, in the womb. And as Jen Wilkin reminded me the other night very strongly, this psalm is not a self-esteem psalm. This psalm is about God Himself. I will give thanks to you, God, for I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Thanks goes to God. Wonderful are your works. You're the creator, and my soul knows it very well that you're wonderful. My frame was not hidden from you, and I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the depths of the earth. You're the one that made me. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance, and in your book were all written the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. God is the one who's sovereign in control. Everything is about God. It begins with God. It unfolds folds in the page of scripture about God it ends with God it's all about him uh, and in this uh, part of being created male and female in his image that is to God's glory in his design verse 28 then he lays out what we do as image bearers God blessed them and God said to them be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth uh, if you were here last week, and, and we're here for our seniors and honoring our seniors, uh, in the 11 o'clock, we had them live, so it just depends what service you were in, uh, and one of the young men, uh, they were all given the opportunity to put uh, their impact, what the impact they want to make on the world, and one of the young men said, I want to be fruitful and multiply. That's a young man that understands the scriptures. <laughs> Could have been one of the best moments of the day. This is God's design. Male and female, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, do it, rule over it. I've made you uniquely to do that, God says. This is God's design. Well, there's another piece to his design that we see in Genesis 1 and 2, and that's a, a work-rest rhythm. A work-rest rhythm that's based in the creation. See, God is a God of order. He's rational, he's beautiful, he's creative. And he's, and he's designed us to work, and he's designed us to rest, and there's a rhythm with it. Verse 31 of chapter 1, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day, then verse 1 of chapter 2, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their hosts. Everything was done. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had done. Verse 3, then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. God set up a, a divine rhythm of work and rest. His rhythm matches his work in creation. It's six days of work and one day of rest. It's work hard and rest well. It is a sanctified day 
in verse 3, meaning it's been set apart. God set apart that seventh day because he rested from all his work, which God had created and made. God's the one who established the week. Now, the psalmist would write and say that, that God doesn't rest, sleep, or slumber. He doesn't sleep or slumber. So what does it mean then by rest? The word rest here means to cease. So the idea of resting on the Sabbath is to cease from our normal work. In the fourth command that God would give Israel when he called them out to be his people in Exodus, he would sanctify that seventh day as a day of rest. And they were to make sure that that one day of rest was not just for themselves, but for anyone that was under their care. It was the responsibility in that home. Six days of work and one day of rest. What did God do after he finished on that sixth day? He said, this was very good. What do we do as a part of that day of rest? We cease from whatever is our normal activity, our normal work, and we break. And part of what we do is what God did. We savor and reflect on what God did in those previous six days. And on that day, we trust that God will take care of everything just fine while we're resting and ceasing from the work. It's a day that we worship. It's a day that we rest. It's a day that we reflect. It's a day that we remember. There's a work-rest rhythm. The work we see is established in Genesis 1 and 2. Everything is perfect, perfect purity, perfect pleasure. And work is established in the context of perfect harmony. Work is not the punishment. Work is good. I was late to the 8 a.m. this morning when I was at the gym. I ended up in two longer conversations than usual. And uh, and when I was leaving, there's a guy there that he works really, really hard. And I just made a comment in the parking lot. I was walking by him and I said, you know what? You set a great example for hard work. And he said, thanks. He said, I just, I, I love to work. So I've always done. He said, I don't know why I do it. And I said, well, you're a great example. I got in the car and I just kicked myself. I said, man, you just missed that moment. And I thought, I hadn't missed it yet. So I got in the car, and I drove back by him. I rolled the window down, and I said, let me tell you why you love to work. Because you're most like God when you work hard. Because that's God's design. And when we work hard, that's the way God designed us. That's why you like working hard. And then we just started talking, and I thought, "Uh uh-oh, I've got work to do at (laughs) 8. But God designed us to work. In 2.15, then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. His first work was to, to take care of the garden, to take care of what God created. There's a work and a rest rhythm that God has designed for us. With the end of chapter 2, in God's design. So we have the... The pleasure of purity in his creation. We have the pleasure of purity of male and female made in the image of God. We have the the pleasure of God's purity to set life up in a way that will be meaningful and purposeful with a work-rest rhythm. And then in the last part, he sets up marriage. He, He does that in the context of all of his creation. He's establishing all the major building blocks of how we'll thrive in life in these two chapters. In verse 18, the Lord God said, 
It's not good for the man to be alone. I'll make him a helper suitable for him. So we see earlier in chapter 2 that out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree. It was, it was uh, the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground, breathed his life into his nostrils, into life, his life. He became a living being, but it was only him. And here he was in the midst of all of God's creation, and he was alone. And so God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. So I'll make a helper suitable for him. The word helper is the Hebrew word ezer, E-Z-E-R. It's used multiple times in the Old Testament to describe God as our helper. It also can be used in a military sense, where the person that's helping is uh, like a, a warrior coming to help. Here he says, I'm going to make him a helper. The idea being one who supplies the strength to an area that is lacking. So for this first man, he said, I'm going to bring you someone that can be a strength where you lack that strength. The word suitable means fit for him. I'm going to bring you somebody that is fit for you. That is a good fit. A companion who's a good fit. In Linda Dillow's book, Creative Counterpart. I, I have enjoyed Linda Dillow's books over the years. They're written, written to women. Um, and I, I try to do my part. I, I understand I'm preaching to men and women. Uh, and I try to do my part to understand how a woman thinks because God did, make, did not make me a woman. Uh, and so I, I need help uh, often to understand uh, how to relate well there. But Linda Dillow says this uh, about the helper. See, God's plan for marital happiness involves a spiritual head and a creative counterpart. So she refers to the helper here as a creative counterpart. Instead of competing with each other and complaining to each other, God's man and God's woman complete each other. A creative counterpart is a helpmate, a compliment to her husband. She not only allows her husband to be the leader, but also encourages him to take the leadership by reverencing him and by being submissive to him. She's chosen to be submissive because God has commanded it, and because she's convinced that only completion will result in a vital, fulfilling marriage. The role of helpmate indicates not a status of inferiority, but a functional difference. The wife is in submission to her husband in the same way that Christ is in submission to the Father. Yet Christ and the Father are equal in one. There cannot be two leaders. The purpose is functional teamwork, that allows two people to complement each other, not compete with each other in life. Women sometimes say, don't say submission so loudly. I hope to show you that submission is not a dirty word, but your hope of becoming all that God intended and all that you desire. Christ is subject to God. He's equal to God. He's very God, but he is subject to the Father. Jesus, creator of heaven and earth, submitted himself to God and took his place in the chain of authority. It's no shame or dishonor for a wife to be under authority if the Lord Jesus was. Each marriage partner has a blessed, unique responsibility, a purpose in life that the other cannot possibly fulfill and cannot happily exist without. She goes on to say, that the passage on submission sounds as if our husbands got together and wrote it, doesn't it? They didn't. God did. Please note that God does not say your husband has earned the right to be your head or has deserved it. He says that he, God, decided this was the best plan and therefore asks you to honor the plan. God had many plans available to him and he chose this one. Believe it or not, it's to your advantage. God designed a helper, a creative counterpart. 
how did he do this? We caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and then he took one rib and, and fashioned uh, that rib into a woman. There's a line here in verse 22 that I'd not noticed before until probably two or three years ago. In verse 22, it says, God brought her to him. God brought her to him. And his response was one of pure elation. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. The idea is here. When God designed marriage, there's a, there's a pleasure of purity here. She, she's a part of me, he says. And, and then God says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined. That word joined is a, a word that would mean like glue. It, it's, a, it's an unbreakable bond that happens when there's a marriage covenant. We see that word later in Scripture. And, and when there's that marriage covenant, it's not to be broken. And they shall become one flesh. There's a, a oneness that God has designed in the marriage relationship. So there's ideas here. The idea of permanence. The idea of an, un, an unbreakable bond. The idea of oneness. And then in verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Why, why would he write that? It's the most vulnerable place two people could be. And there's a trust. There's a trust here. There's a sacredness and a trust. There's a pleasure and a purity. We see that unfold in Scripture, the, the pleasure that God has intended in the, the sexual part of the relationship. In Proverbs chapter 5 and, and in the Song of Songs, in eight chapters, it's... Uh, uh, it is a, a book of the Bible that just describes the, uh, the erotic nature, the romance, the, the enjoyment of the husband and the wife. And, uh, and it's just laid out in just very erotic terms. See, God, God has a design. He has a, intends there to be pleasure in the sexual relationship in the marriage. And there's a purity to it. And he lays it out. In his word, celebrates it. Well, Jesus in Matthew 19 also comes back to the end of Genesis 2 to establish marriage as he's designed it. Paul does the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5, and we actually see the reason for why he set it up in Ephesians chapter 5. God knew from the outset the way he established things, and then the why behind it we see as it unfolds in Christ. In Ephesians 5, 22, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. I will, in almost every wedding I do, I'll work through Ephesians 5 with them. Because this is God's beautiful design of the marriage relationship. And what a gift that God would have for the wives to represent the church who Christ died for to represent the church in the marriage relationship. And for the wife as the church to gladly and voluntarily yield to the leadership of the husband. That's what the church does with Christ. Christ. Now, I look the, the future husband in the eyes 
at almost every wedding ceremony I do, and say, you have the harder job. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husband, your job, your role as God designed it, is to love your wife the same way Christ loved the church. And how did Christ love the church? He sacrificed for her, gave himself up for her, laid his life down for her so that she could be everything he intends her to be. I've yet to find a marriage relationship where there's a husband that is following Christ and willing to lay his life down for his wife and serve her that the wife has not been willing to joyfully and gladly follow his lead as God designed. This is God's design. He said, well, what about if I'm single, if this is God's design? Jesus was single. Paul was single. They're the two that wrote these things. From Matthew 19 and Ephesians 5. Jesus said them. Paul wrote them. Paul would actually argue in 1 Corinthians 7. He talked about the value of marriage. But he actually argued it would be better to be single. Then he could be full on, not divided In his loyalties. In verse 35, this I say for your own benefit, not to put a restraint upon you. She's not restraining it for anyone, but to promote what is appropriate and to secure undistracted devotion to the Lord. I've seen so many single people in their adult lives that have been verse 35 of chapter 7 in 1 Corinthians that have had an undistracted devotion to the Lord. And they are an incredibly beautiful picture of what Christ has designed for the church. Aloneness is a problem. So how is a single person, how does that happen for them based on God's design? That's on our church community to have the richest of Christ-like community for the single person So that there's not the aloneness. That is God's design. The reality is. Our world is a broken world. And based on our experience. Our own sin nature. All kinds of things. We've opted for other designs. Than God's design. This is what's so amazing about God and the pleasure of the purity of God. See, he gave us a way and he pursued us in such a way that we can re-enter the design when we've left it. On the cross, Jesus took on the full displeasure of his father And took on all the impurities of our sin on himself. By doing that, he provided a way for us to come back in to what is life-giving, pleasurable, and pure. In John 10.10, it says, The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy I came that they might have life and might have it abundantly. Jesus knew that the thief came to rob us of the pleasure of God's purity. And he gave us a way in to not just confess and repent, but to confess and repent and to be brought into abundant life. That life of pleasure that he's called us into. In Acts 3, chapter 3, verse 19. 
It says, therefore, repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. See, the, the way into God's design, the, the pleasure of the purity of his design is by way of repentance, godly sorrow, genuine brokenness over my sin against God and trying to figure out my own path, my own design, chasing after ways that are counter to his ways. But in his pursuit of me, he says, here's the way in. It's the way of repentance. And then he says, you'll be refreshed. Refreshment comes when we repent in the presence of the Lord. Because now we're back into Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life and your presence is fullness of joy. And in your right hand, there are pleasures forever. And it's amazing what Jesus has done with his work. Because all those things I just talked about in Genesis 1 and 2. We break those and Jesus restores those. The creation, God humbly entered into the creation we broke. And in Christ gives us the opportunity to become new creations from the inside out. And in the end, in Revelation, it says he'll come to make all things new. In Revelation 21 and 22, we see Genesis 1 and 2 being remade. So that we anticipate a day where we get to see what Genesis 1 and 2 is like. All things are made new in Christ. When we think about the image of God, it's broken. One seminary professor I had actually said, we're subhuman in our sin. But what did Jesus do? He restores the broken image. So now I can think rightly again. I can appreciate the beauty again. I can think well again. I can relate well again. He restores that. The broken him so we're human again. That work rest rhythm. Jesus did the work for us. And on the cross, he said, it's finished. And he rested. We don't have to do the work. Christ did the work. Jesus said, come to me, our weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. The rest is in Christ. All things made new in him. I said earlier that that part in Genesis 2 I'd not realized before that God brought the woman to him and he was elated. In 1 Peter 3.18, Jesus is the one that's bringing us to God and he's elated to bring us to the Father. And he calls all of us collectively the bride of Christ. And he invites us in Revelation to the marriage supper of the Lamb where we'll feast and celebrate in his new creation for all time. A relationship of permanence, an unbreakable bond, a oneness, a sacredness the only God could establish. That's where our pleasure is found. How's your heart? Does that stir it a little bit today more for God? Gratitude, praise. Is there anywhere you've drifted in there? You think, wow, I've gotten away from what God says. Or does it just flat bother you what I said? This is God's design. I just wanted to give you God's design to consider today. And we're wide open to conversation. Please have the dialogue. Any parts, have the dialogue. This week in life groups with your family, talk about, I, I chose not to give you practical things today. I just wanted you to see the bigness of God's design. Now, how does it look in everyday life? Let's have great conversations around God's design. And how we can spur each other on. 
and have hard conversations gracefully with each other. Father, thank you for uh, your goodness towards us. Love, God, your design. Thank you for uh, bringing uh, us into it. And, uh, and Father, thank you for um, really just ongoing bringing me back into it again and again. So I'm just grateful for your forgiveness when I deviate and get outside of what your purposes are and outside of what your glory is. Today, Father, I pray that our hearts would be stirred uh, in awe of you, God, that our respect for you would would deepen uh, today. Uh, And God, I pray that wherever we disagree or whether we don't like it or whether it disturbs us, will you help us, Father, to engage in real conversation with people and uh, and Father, I pray that, that we'll be the safest place, the most loving place, but we'll also be kind in speaking truth, God. We're not kind when we don't speak truth, so I pray you'll help us to uh, be truth speakers, but loaded with grace and mercy, God. Teach us how to do that. Help us to grow together in it, and Father, I pray you'll grow us uh, increasingly in our love for you and what you've done, and I pray that in Jesus' name. In this quiet space, what I'd ask you to do is, just based on what we've talked about and what I've asked at the end, where are you in that? Uh, Maybe it's a time for gratitude to the Lord. Maybe it's time for repentance. Maybe it's time to just start jotting out what your questions are. Or you may have those lodged away really well. Uh, But just determine and be resolved, I'm going to talk to somebody about this and uh, and have a conversation about it. Uh, So let this be a space to kind of get your thoughts gathered uh, between you and the Lord. And, uh, and how that might look ongoing. And uh, we have some exciting things coming this summer, so if you look at the screen, I want to get your attention that way. Ten years. Good. How about you? Can't believe it's been ten years. Whoa, do I feel old. So we're excited to be able to announce to you guys that our active sports camp 
registrations are open starting now. Um, you can click on the little QR code, they fill up quickly, so we encourage you to do that. We'll have a morning session and an afternoon session that's available. Um, for 10 years, we've been getting active in God's Word and active in our sports, but this year, there's a twist. Mm -hmm. We're changing things up. It looks like T-Shirt Guy and the kids are going to be learning all about putting on the armor of God. And so we just feel like we want to equip our kids strongly to walk in this world. And then we'll still partner with Nick mm -hmm. and Global Sports and get active in our sports throughout the day. So It's going to be fun, lots of fun. So you'll want to join us. And, volu and adults, if you're feeling a little bit left out and you want to get active, we have lots of volunteer opportunities. So there's also a place for you to sign up to come and volunteer for us each on both weeks if you want to. Active juniors only in the morning session. Active sports camp is in both, in both afternoon and morning. So, And if you're not really a sports person and don't really want to do that, we also have something fun. Oh, yeah, active in the Word this summer, and that happens in 1 Corinthians as we begin our summer Bible study on May the 31st. Lots of information on that, but as you know that as we study 1 Corinthians, we see that Paul travels through a lots of challenges the church had and the world had, and so a lot of those same challenges are happening to us today, and he kind of gives us some ways to navigate those as we just kind of study the Word together, so you'd really love to do that, and for more information on that awesome Bible study that's coming up, you can scan that QR code on the back of your chair. It's a very important QR code. So. And if you don't want to wait to be active, you can be active today by going to our membership lunch mm -hmm. at 1230, which is upstairs. Um, and you can just find out what we believe as a church and how you can plug in and become a part of 121. And so as we dismiss today, we have a team that would love to pray for you, with you. If you'd like to pray with them, they'll be down front. And also, uh, if you filled out any of those Connect cards or you have a prayer request on the cards, you can leave those with anybody in the lobby at our Connection team. And as an act of continued worship, we can leave your tithes and offerings as you go out. But have a wonderful Sunday and a great week. Have a great day. Thanks, guys. Yeah.